Come all you weary, come all you thirsty. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. guys let's wake up that's great news isn't it let's go let's celebrate together as we come together and worship him yes bring all your failures bring your addictions bring all your failures bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting there with open arms see his open arms for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so loved god so loved the world praise god praise god praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him praise him for the wonders of his love praise god praise god praise god from whom all blessings flow praise him praise him for the wonders of his love for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now it is well, I'm walking in freedom for God so loved, God so loved the world. Yes. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Amen. All right, from Psalms 100. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. And his faithfulness continues to each generation. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. 
all of my days I want to praise the wonders of your mighty My comfort My comfort My shelter My tower of refuge and strength Let every pain all that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord on the earth, let us see power and majesty. Praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound. Of your name, I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus. And my shelter, my tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, oh, and I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing power and might. Majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. But sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I stand. Nothing compares to the promise. Shout to the Lord, shout to the Lord of the earth, let us sing power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. Love you for 
that is who he is. And with that, I, want, I just want us to just think about how great our God is and the miracles that he gives in our lives. We may have that one thing, if not a few things, that I feel like we constantly pray about and we're just waiting and waiting for God to answer. And it really challenges our faith. And with that, I wanted to, do, to give just even a, a quick little testimony to give those who could really use some hope. I, my husband and I um, took almost three years of trying to grow our family with treatment after treatment. Um, we really struggled and it really challenged our faith. And I really wanted, felt it in my heart to share that because with moments that we thought we were never going to be parent, um, like I'm now 12 weeks pregnant. So. <laughs> ever wonder if God will ever come through, I promise that he will. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
are. We love you, right? We love her. We're so happy for you. Congratulations. <laughs> Praise God for a miracle. He is a way maker. He is a miracle worker. And amen. I mean, there's really not much more to say. I mean, praise God. Hallelujah, right? We love you. Yay. <laughs> All right, everybody, you can sit down now. <laughs> Try not to trip anybody with my corded mic here. There we go. That's awesome, right? That is an awesome way to start out a worship service, to end like that. That song is affecting, right? We, we come and we come with all of our, our struggles and our baggage and the, the pain that we bring, and we know that God still is good. He still does amazing things. We read about it in our words, but we know about it in our lives. Um, God is so, so good. And so we're really thankful for you guys, for your ministry here. Um, and all of you. Uh, I know God is working in so many different ways. Remember last week I asked you guys on your connect cards to give us prayer uh, praises. Well, you guys actually gave us some praises this week. So if you guys check out the, the uh, email that goes out every week, check out those praises and, and praise the Lord for those things. Uh, I think we have another one, obviously. Um, but continue to fill up these cards with praises, with prayer requests. We want to hear both of them. We want to hear the good things that are happening in your lives. We want to hear the bad things that are happening in your lives. We just want to hear from you, and so we appreciate that. We love being able to pray for you guys, and so um, this is a great way to be able to do that. So if you want to fill out your connect card, especially if you're new here to Homeport, if this is your first time, fill one of those out. Um, we'll get in contact with you. There's a couple check boxes to check if you want to be contacted or not. Um, we are super respectful of that, so we're always happy to abide by those, um, whatever you check. So let us know. We'd love to, to hear from you. We'd love to talk to you through this week. Um, we also want to, we just have a couple quick announcements. They're pretty much all about camp. We are coming back up towards camp season. I know it just felt like we ended that like three weeks ago because um, camp is almost year-round. If you're there for retreats, if you're there for men's and women's retreats, if you're there for summer camp, if you are brave enough, I'd love to have you for summer camp. Um, it's with middle school kids. I'm not going to lie to you. It's hard, um, but it's awesome. You will learn a lot about yourself. You will learn where your limits are. You will learn what happens when you push past those limits, um, as many of my youth kids know. So um, please join us for that. Um, if you want to support us in a different way uh, and not come to camp, you can come and bring sugar, flour, and um, working on it. Pudding mix. That's what it was. And pudding mix. And you'll be able to see all of that um, on that back table. We're going to try and stack that table up so that the flour actually becomes a problem. And so flour and sugar, go ahead and stack that on that front table. Um, over the next couple of weeks. Other than that, we have women's tea coming up. I believe it's this Saturday. Yes, and it's going to be awesome. It looks like a ton of fun. You guys are going to take over the sanctuary. It's going to be a lot of fun for that. I know Jillian's leading out some worship songs, so that is going to be great. Let's pray as we come into this time of our sermon today as Ben comes up to deliver our message. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We praise you for this day. Thank you and praise you for everything that you do every single day, God. Um, God, help us to see the miracles that happen all around us all the time. Um, I know that sometimes we're really closed-eyed about that. And um, help us to just see. Help us to see what you're doing, um, not only through this church, but in, through all the churches in St. Augustine. Lord, help us to, to, um, to build one another up. Lord, I pray for Ben as he comes up to deliver our message. Lord, just pray that you would be, give him the words to speak. Help us have the ears to listen and the hearts to understand your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. It's a beautiful day outside. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at Homeport. I just want to welcome you guys to Homeport this morning. Um, man, like Jordan said, we have the women's ministry tea coming up. We had a great men's breakfast yesterday. Um, and I just want to encourage you guys to get involved in those ministries. I was listening to a, a great podcast this week, and the, um, the guy who was speaking, uh, being interviewed, he was talking about this, there's this myth of autonomy that we have as Americans, Westerners really, um, culturally, where we've, we've just been programmed to do life on our own. We're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We don't really need anybody. We're really uncomfortable at times talking about what's going on, especially when it comes to like spirituality and things. Um, but he's like, but the, the guy was like, but it's just a myth. 
we were really designed for community. Every time, or not every time, but the vast majority of the yous in the New Testament are actually you alls. It's a plural. I'm going to come out with a southern version. It's just going to say y'all, right? And we all, we all know it's not just me that it's, you know, Paul's not talking to me. He's not saying you, Ben. He's saying you all, Homeport, you all, the church, um, need to do these things together. And so I just want to invite you to be a part of those. If you've never been to a women's, women's ministry event, the women's ministry tea is going to be a beautiful time for you to come out and be a part of that. Um, they meet monthly. We, the men's meet monthly. Um, there's just a lot of ministry done together, and I just want to invite you to be a part of that. Um, I got this picture uh, this week on Thursday. Um, if, if you got my email, you know, right? It wasn't quite church appropriate, so... Um, <laughs> So I, I just, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? So if you can't see that far. Um, but I love it when people read my email and then shoot something back to me. I got this picture via text, but I get emails, replies. I get people stopping me in the hallway going, hey, um, you know, this just really spoke to me. What? And so uh, I love it when you guys read the emails. If you're not getting those emails, you want to get those emails, make sure we have your email address on the Connect card. Say, I want to stay connected We'd love to get you uh, those things. They just, it's just a way for us to stay um, connected with you guys so you know what's going on at Homeport. A lot of times we do like a quick introduction to what's coming up, what God is going to be talking about this week uh, in that email. And so this week we were talking about strengthening our faith like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Like we want to be these buff guys uh, and women spiritually, right? We may not have been bodybuilders, um, but we may not be gym rats, but we want to be strong in our faith. And, and the message this week, what we're going to be seeing in Acts chapter 26, is going to help us do just that. This, ma- this message is about connecting points. We want to connect the Old Testament to Jesus. And that's what Paul is going to tell, um, is, is going to tell King Agrippa here in just a little bit as we get into that text. And these, these connection points help us see what our faith is built on. It's, it's not just that Jesus rose from the dead, right? Like, not that that's not enough, right? Like, he rose from the dead. But, the, but how many times can we look back and take all the points and show that God had a plan that he was at work at in the world to bring the Messiah um, into our lives to save us? This was his plan. Jesus doesn't just show up on the scene and claim to be the Messiah with no, you know, no background, no uh, proof. These prophecies that we're going to talk about uh, point to his, uh, who he is from the beginning of his life to the end of his life, and they're all foretold in the Old Testament so that we can see that Jesus really is the Son of God. All right. Go ahead. We are going to open our Bibles. We are in Acts chapter 26. We are two sermons from the end of this series. Uh, We'll be wrapping up next weekend. Uh, But this week we're going to look at Acts 26, kind of 27, just in proximity. But go ahead and grab your Bibles, and um, we're going to dig through Scripture together. You know what I'm about to ask you, so grab your Bibles, open them up. And then once you got your Bible open... Let me see who's with me this morning. I got some Bibles. All right. Awesome. Love to see it. You guys are amazing. We're going to dig through Scripture together. And as we see what um, is, is going on um, and, and what Paul is talking about, you'll notice in your bulletins um, there's a list of Old Testament references that we're going to work through uh, this morning. The Apostle Paul has been in prison now for two years in Caesarea. Um, and that's where we're picking up in Acts 26. There was an old governor named Felix. He has left his position and has turned it over to a man named Festus. But to gain favor with the Jews and them not stone him on his way out because he wasn't the most well-liked man in uh, Jewish history, um, he leaves Paul in prison. Even though there's no... um, There's no charges that he could bring against him. There's nothing to prove why he should be there. He still leaves him in prison. And so just as it had been with Felix, 
Now Festus comes in, the Jewish leaders want um, Paul brought back to uh, Jerusalem so that they can kill him along the way. Uh, but here, Paul gives his defense, he shares his testimony, but this time he appeals to Caesar. And in Roman, um, in Roman law, his appeal to Caesar now has to be fulfilled. It's almost as if there's, he can't even back out of it. It's like, it's just, it's written in stone because Festus is going to, in 26 and 27, he's trying to figure out what to actually charge him with. Like, he doesn't want to look like an idiot by sending this this innocent man back to Rome, right, to go before Caesar and waste the emperor's time. And so he brings in this other um, leader, ruler in the area, a guy named King Agrippa. He comes from the line of Herod. Um, Herod is, remember, we remember Herod the Great from Jesus' birth story. He was the one who killed all the young boys. They fled um, Israel to Egypt until he died. He thought he was as good as God, and then God showed him and ate his body with worms. It's kind of gross. Um, but it's biblical, so it's in there. All right, so we're in Acts chapter 27, or 26. Paul is giving his conversion account. He's telling King Agrippa, how he came to faith, who he was as a Pharisee, how he pushed back against the way. He wanted to kill them. He went as far as Damascus to try and do that to the church. But along the way, he says that Jesus stopped him dead in his tracks, and he converted to Christianity and now is in chains because of that. And in Acts chapter 26, we're going to start in verse 22. It says this, but God This is Paul saying this. But God has protected me right up to this present time here so I can testify to everyone from the least to the greatest. This is where we're going to focus this morning. I teach nothing except the prophets and Moses, um, nothing except what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and be the first to raise from dead, and in this way announce God's light to Jews and Gentiles alike. Suddenly, Festus shouts, Paul, you're insane. Too much study has made you crazy. Paul replied, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is of sober truth. And King Agrippa knows these things. I speak boldly, for I'm sure these events are all familiar to him, for they are not done in a corner. And King Agrippa said, or King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. And Agrippa interrupted him. Do you think you can persuade me to become a Christian so quickly? Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am except for these chains. Paul is now before Agrippa, a Jew. He's pointing back to these Old Testament texts, texts that the Jews would have been very familiar with as they awaited their Messiah, especially now as they're under the thumb of Rome. They are more interested uh, than ever in their coming Savior, the one that will deliver them from rule, from Roman rule and occupation. And, but that point right there is why they don't believe that Jesus is the Savior. Because in their mind, it was so much more important to them to be delivered from Rome so that they could continue on their traditions than it was for them to be saved in their souls. And even the Messiah, could, Jesus could come and he could do all these things to save us so that we could be made right with God and that the Old Testament law could be put, together, or put away forever. But the fact that he didn't save them from Rome and bring peace to Israel in that moment, he couldn't be the Messiah. But Paul argues that that is just not the truth. He tells Agrippa that all he's done is, is teach what these prophets and Moses said. They think he's mad, but he's not mad. He says, I'm sober-minded, and he boldly proclaims these truths that Agrippa would have known, these connections that he would have been able to make, these dots that have brought together And so he proclaims this truth to Agrippa. And something must have stirred in his heart, right? Something must have stirred in his heart because he says, why do you think you could persuade me? Paul hasn't said anything about, hey, Agrippa, when are you going to become a Christian, right? But something is stirring in Agrippa's heart. He can see all of these connection points. And he says, why do you think you could persuade me so quickly? But Paul's prayer there in verse 29, I think is a prayer that should be a prayer for all of us. 
that we want all the people that we come in contact with, all of those that we are sharing our faith with, to know uh, who he is and that they might too become a follower of Jesus just as we have. This morning, I want to focus on these things. What did the Old Testament say about the Messiah? All the way back in Old Testament history, we can go all the way back to the Jewish time in Israel, we actually, or in Egypt. Actually, we could go all the way back to the Garden of Eden if we, um, if we had chosen to and showed that the Messiah was talked about there in the garden. He's talked about here in Egypt that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. And as Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, is blessing his sons before he dies in Egypt, um, he says this. um, uh, I think I deleted all my notes there. I'll flip over there. Actually, it's there. Um, Let's go to that next slide. It says, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs. The one. Not the kingly line will stay in the line of Judah. He's not talking about that. He's saying that there's one who will come, who will take the ruler's scepter, and, um, and it will belong to him. And then it says, that one whom all the nations will honor. Jacob prophesied that the lineage of his son, Judah, would come the ruler. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the one with whom all nations will honor. Moses prophesied that the Messiah would be like him and probably should have been the other way around. I'm going to be like the one coming. But he says in Deuteronomy chapter 18 um, that the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites, and you must listen to him. This isn't just any prophet. This is the one, the one that we would listen to. This is the coming Messiah intertwined with God's promises to King David about his rule and reign and how his son will sit on the throne is a promise that a descendant of David will sit on the throne forever. Not not that they will sit on the throne forever, that lineage, but that that this one will sit on the throne forever. 2 Samuel chapter 7 says, For when you die and you are buried with your ancestors, I will raise up for one of, your desc- one of your descendants, your own offspring, and I will make his kingdom strong. He is the one who will build this house, a temple for my name, and I will secure his royal throne forever. And I will be his father, and he will be my son and this is where it kind of intertwines about who's going to build the temple and, and this adoption of um, God and Solomon, and he says, if, his, if he sins, I will correct and discipline him with a rod like any father would do, but my favor will never be taken from him as, as I took it from Saul, who I removed from your sight. Man, I deleted all my notes here. I am really apologized this morning. Like half my notes are all gone. This is fun. You ever, you ever felt like you were talking without notes? Do you know what you're supposed to say next? Because I don't know what I'm supposed to say next. No, I'm just joking. All right. I have it right here. 12 through 16. Oops. Where am I? No. Nope. Why do there have to be two Samuels, right? <laughs> Why can't there just be one long Samuel? Couldn't this just be like Samuel 792nd or something? <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 7. 12 through 16, that's where I am. He says, but your favor will not be taken from him as I took it from Saul, who I removed from your sight. Your house and your kingdom will continue before me for all time, and your throne will be secure forever. This is what uh, uh, Samuel or, and Nathan prophesy about King David and the Messiah coming from his throne Messiah in Micah chapter 2, it says that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. 
But to you, O Bethlehem, uh, Pepherthath, because I don't speak Hebrew, um, you are uh, only a small village among your people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are distant and past will come from you on my behalf. Both of these uh, prophecies we see in Luke chapter 2 when it says at the time of Rome, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken through the Roman emperor. Verse 3 says all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census and because Joseph was a descendant of King David he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary whom he was engaged and whom was now expecting a child. Jesus fulfills both of those promises as a descendant of King David who was born in Bethlehem. We fast forward from the time of David to the time of Daniel, the Daniel we know of Daniel in the lion's den. And he prophesies at the end of the book of Daniel about when the Messiah would come, the arriving before the destruction of the second temple says this, and it's kind of wordy, so just kind of follow along. He says, a period of 70 sets of seven will be decreed for your people and your holy city to finish their rebellion, to put an end to their sin and atone for their guilt, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to confirm a prophetic vision and anoint the most highly place. Now listen and understand, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from time to, uh, from the time of the command given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler the anointed one, another word for the Messiah, comes. Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the streets with strong, uh, and strong defenses despite their perilous times. After the period of 62 sets of seven, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing, and a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and a war and its miseries are all decreed from uh, that time to the very end. That ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of seven, but after, a time in the, but after half of this time, he will put an end to all sacrifices and offerings, and as a climax to all his terrible deeds, he will set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate decreed for this defiler to be proud, uh, poured out upon him. And what David, or Daniel is referencing is that the Roman emperor will will come in and they will destroy the city of Jerusalem again. He puts up a sacrilegious object called the abomination of desolation on the temple, uh, on the altar in the temple before he destroys it. In 538 BC, Zerubbabel began his work to rebuild the temple. So however you can count those dates of 70 sets of seven plus 60, it's a, it's a mess, right? But, it, but what that accumulates is, is from the time of Daniel, to this time in 538, Zerubbabel begins his work to rebuild the temple, which is recorded for us in the book of Ezra. Daniel's prophecy says that after that occurs, the countdown to the Messiah begins. And it's pretty easy. You know, we see him coming in. We see his birth. And then after that, and you know, what we just celebrated through Easter, we see that Jesus dies on a cross. And it's pretty easy to see what Daniel was getting at, that his life accomplished nothing, right? I mean, he, was, he only had discipled 12 leaders. He only had 500 people show up right before he ascends to heaven. It looks as if Jesus isn't the guy. Like, it looks as if he accomplished nothing on this earth. But from those 11 guys on the other side of the crucifixion, who raise up to be apostles, and those 500 followers that are there after just a few hundred years, just fast forward into the, the 400s, and now we take about 500 people, and we're looking at three to five million followers of Jesus in the Roman Emperor, in the Roman Empire, right? He didn't accomplish nothing. It looks like he did, he might have not, but he didn't. We know what he's accomplished, right? We here celebrate today the life of Jesus 2,000 years later because his story still changes lives. These are the prophecies. These are the connection points. These are how we see these things together. 
Zechariah prophesied that, Messiah, that the Messiah would come riding on a donkey. In Zechariah chapter 9, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in trum- triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. When a king would ride into a, a town after, um, after uh, defeating it, he could ride in two ways. He could ride in on a horse, which is he's come in with a, 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 you know, his hammer, he is coming to destroy, or he could come in riding on a donkey, which is peace. And Drew, Jesus rides in to, uh, into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, riding on the back of a donkey. He comes to bring peace, God's peace to this. We can see Jesus riding into Jerusalem in John chapter 12. David records that the Messiah would be tortured to death. He says, and if you, we, we'll point them out along the way, but there are so many things that line up with Jesus' death and his time on the cross. He begin, David begins chapter 22 by saying, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far when I groan for your help? Jesus cries out in his, some of his last words, these very words, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? David writes, every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted you to rescue them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. But I am a worm, not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me as all the leaders and the Jews came by uh, Golgotha to see Jesus nailed to that cross. They mock him for who he is. They sneer and shake their heads, David wrote. Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. The Pharisees say this exact statement. If this is the one who relies on the Lord, then let the Lord save him. The Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. You brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast. I, tr- I, I was thrust into your arms at birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Do not stay far from me, for trouble is near, and no one can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls. Fierce bulls of Bashan have hemmed me in. Like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into their prey. My life is poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, melting within me. My strength is dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang close on me, uh, close in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. A thousand years before the Romans will will create, will invent crucifixion for people who stoned their people to death. That was their form of execution. David writes, they have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them and throw uh, dice for my clothing. This is the casting of lots that they did that the Roman soldiers did for his garments. They didn't want to tear it because it was all one piece. And so they threw dice to see who could win his clothes. And then he closes, O Lord, do not stay far away. You are my strength. Come quickly to my aid. Save me from the sword. Spare my precious life from these dogs. Snatch me from the lion's jaws and the horns of these wild oxen. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters, and I will praise you among your assembled people. David so eloquently catches and writes all these prophecies that would be fulfilled in the life of Jesus. From being nailed to the cross, to crying out to God, to his garments being divided. David captures all of this in one psalm. Lastly, I want to look at the description of the suffering servant that comes out of Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah writes, see my servant will proper, and he will be highly exalted. But many are amazed when they, when they saw him. His faith was, face was so disfigured, he was hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. 
and he will startle many nations. King will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they had not been told, and they will understand what they had not been heard. But who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant will grow up in the Lord's presence like a tender shoot, like a root from the ground. Though there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing that would attract us to him, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with the deepest grief. Yet we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought our troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sin. But even Isaiah says, but he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sin. He was beaten so that we could be made whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. Yet all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path on our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated heartily harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb led to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before his shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, and he had never deceived anyone, yet he was buried like a criminal, put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to, cause, uh, to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when, of it, yet when his life was made an offering for our sins, he will have many descendants. That's us. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. And when we see all that he's accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will we'll make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear their sins. And I will give him the honor of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. And he was counted among the rebels, and he bore the sins of, and interceded for many rebels. Again, 750 years before Jesus would come to this earth, Isaiah prophesied about how he would live and how he would die. And these passages are passages that Paul might have taught as he was making those connections for King Agrippa when he says, I only taught the prophets and Moses. These are just a few of some over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus would fulfill in his life. One guy who is much, much smarter than I and understands all of statistics, which I don't. Uh, they don't teach you that kind of stuff in Bible college. And um, that's a joke. You can laugh. Um, <laughs> But he said that Jesus fulfilling all of these prophecies about him in the Old Testament would be the same as if you could find one red silver dollar in an area the size of Texas filled three feet tall with silver dollars. That's the statistical improbability that Jesus could fulfill all of these prophecies. For us, it's important that we can make these connections, that we could see that the God of the Old Testament was working out his plan from creation through the fall to redemption in Christ Jesus to one day where we will be completely redeemed and rescued. But we have to make these connections. The Old Testament under, helps us understand it was God's good plan to save us. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for sinners. This morning, that is why we, we come together and worship and praise him. Because he has come not only uh, as the one who has died, but the one who has been raised from the dead. And because he has been raised from the dead, we know that we will not taste death either. We can believe that all this is true. We can place our faith securely in him because he fulfilled these prophecies. Because these, these prophecies are true of, um, of the Messiah, the one whom the Jews were promised, the one who proved that Jesus was the Son of God. And so we look at these prophecies and we allow them to strengthen our faith to know that Jesus was more than just a man. He was more than just a good teacher, but he is the son of God proven through scripture over and over 
and over again. I want you guys to pray with me. Father, as we come before you this morning and we look at these connections that are made, I, I pray that you help us to see, just, just be alive in these truths that you have worked all of these details out, all of the meticulous details you have had your hand in so that we could know that, that Jesus is who he says he is. And Father, as we look at the promises of Scripture, we know that you look at the meticulous details of our own lives, that you are at work and you are working through them, just like the song we sang this morning. Even when we can't see it, we know that you are working. And so, Father, I pray that that these words of Scripture, these points, will help us see that how much we can trust you, how much we can put our faith in your word and know that you're working for our good. Even, even when we can't see it, even when it's just one stone in front of us at a time. Father, we thank you for this moment, this opportunity that we can praise you for these things. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever thought about the many choices that we have to make in the time of the day? Our everyday life is filled or controlled by the choices that we make. Some good, some bad. The fact remains, we control the results or outcome of our day based on the choices that we make. Now, I'm sure that all of us want to make good choices so that at the end of the day, we can look back and say, that was a good day. Sadly, way before our time, as a result of a bad choice that was made in the Garden of Eden, we all are born with a sinful nature in us. So making good choice is not the easiest thing to do. Thankfully, we have many stories, many guidelines, many examples in scripture to give us direction in making good choices. John 15 is one of those examples. Jesus is teaching about the vine and the branches. Just reading some from 15, one through seven this morning. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, as he's, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, they're thrown into the fire, and they're burned. So our challenge is to stay in the vine, or in Christ, in his word. In the real world, we have to admit that at some time or another, we've all made some, maybe many, bad choices. We've separated ourselves from the vine. The reality is that one day we will be held accountable for the bad decisions that we've made.
our sovereign, loving, forgiving God did not want us to be picked up and thrown into the fire. So his plan included that he sent his son to be the sacrifice for our bad choices. Jesus, our Savior, died an unimaginable, cruel, and painful death so that we could be forgiven of our bad choices. The emblems that represent the cleansing blood of Jesus that was shed for our sins and his beaten body that was nailed to the cross are prepared and ready for us to partake of. They're placed on the tables in the corner of the room and there'll be one in the front here. There are two cups with the juice cup being placed in the cup that contains the loaf. After our prayer for preparing our hearts to partake in a worthy manner, you're invited to share in the Lord's Supper. Will you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your house today, to be gathered together for the specific purpose of bringing glory to you into your kingdom. We come before you now, Father, thanking you for the gift of your Son, for the love that he had for each and every one of us, for your plan, knowing that we would need a Savior. We thank you for everything that he went through, for the fact that he loved us and he gave his life for us. We pray now, Father, that our hearts and our minds be turned to the fact that these are things we can't do for ourselves. We need Jesus. We pray that you bless this time, prepare us, Bless these emblems as they represent the blood and the body of your son that was nailed to the cross for our sins. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, what a beautiful gathering we've been able to, to come together and worship the Lord and uh, all that he's done for us. It's so good to be together in this house as we've come to worship, and uh, I just thank you for being with us. We love you guys. Don't forget to put your Connect cards and offerings in the back and the Dollar Club in the bucket on your way out. Make sure you're 
staying up to date with what's going on in your bulletin. Um, and uh, we'll see all of y'all real soon. Thanks, everybody.